Greetings, happy holidays, and thank you for joining us today. This is the last forum in our Fall 2021 series. We'll be back with more forums in January 2022. We do appreciate you joining us for today's topic regarding the university circle area. My name is Laura Christian M. Bernoni, and I'm the host for today's discussion titled University Circle, Excellence, Impact, and Surrounding Neighborhoods. We organize these forums as a congregational service to the community to support personal reflection, social action, and to encourage individual and collective growth for all of us. Now, I'd like to introduce the coordinator for today's forum, Ken Fries, a member of our forum committee. He'll introduce the topic and our speakers. Ken. Okay, thank you, Laura. Uh, I want to welcome all the people that have logged in as our um, audience. Uh, today's topic, as Laura pointed out, really looks to University Circle and the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, as you know from the flyer that was sent out at our website, that University Circle was considered the best arts district in the United States by uh, USA Today. It was uh, identified as an extraordinary epicenter of culture, education, art, and healthcare. So the question now is, how are these organizations working with the surrounding neighborhoods and are programs available to art, education, healthcare, and the community safety? So our two guests today are Aaron Miller today and Mitty Amani Jordan. Now I will give a brief introduction for both, but please keep in mind, every time I do this, I feel that somehow when I do a narrative on someone's background, I narrow who they are as a person because the scope of their accomplishments go beyond what I'm saying today. With that said, uh, Aaron Miller Tate currently serves as development manager for community programs at University Circle Inc. And over a decade as an educator, she served in both teaching and administrative roles, including founding Dean of Schools at Bard High School, Early College, and the Cleveland Municipal School District. Her work in the nonprofit sector is focused on program strategy and the community development, including youth, workforce development, community engagement, and grades K through 12. At the University Circle Inc., one of the region's most dynamic community development organizations, she works across multiple departments to create and implement programming, raise funds, evaluate strategies for community education and community efforts to schools and institutions, including Neighborhood Advisory Council of Case Western Reserve and the Circle Partners Education Collaborative, which focuses on the efforts of museums, community-based organizations, and around experimental learning and school engagement. The work drives an agenda within the organization and the circle that emphasizes equity access and countering the effects of systemic racism. Now, Mitty Amani Jordan. Now, I have to tell you this. When I researched her background, it's extensive. So what I say today is extremely truncated. <laughs> Believe me, Mitty is a resident of Huff, Huff Superior, Wade Park neighborhood, and she has been so for 67 years as a resident. And it, that community is adjacent to University Circle where she has spearheaded a development of the Brookdale Orchard, a community, a community mission of St. Matthew United Methodist Church and the Rockefeller Park Community Restoration and Development Organization, Inc. She is a former assistant pastor and director of the Cooperative Parish Ministries for Corey, St. Matthew, and East Glenville United Methodist Congregations. She is also the founding chair of the National Institute for Restorative Justice with a mission to educate for advocacy. Ms. Jordan has held previous leadership positions in cultural affairs higher education and the art institutions at Oberlin College, 
at Caramo House, both in Atlanta, Georgia, Dallas, Texas, and of course, in Cleveland. With that, I welcome our guest and um, we look forward to what they have to share today. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks so much. Erin. Should I just go right and get right into it? <laughs> yes, please. Let me share my screen here. All right, well, uh, thanks so much for having me this morning. <clears throat> I thought I'd start with a little bit of history. So there are so many exciting things that are happening in the circle and it can definitely be confusing um, as to where some of these programs are coming from, who's doing what. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a sense of where this place came from, um, University Circle, and to distinguish between University Circle, the place, and University Circle Incorporated, or what we call UCI. So um, just to give you a general kind of lay of the land, University Circle, the place, sits on the eastern border of the city of Cleveland. It's surrounded on three sides by Cleveland neighborhoods, on the north by Glenville and a little sliver of the St. Clair Superior neighborhood. Uh, on the west, it's uh, bordered by Huff and Midtown. And on the south, it's bordered by Fairfax and the area sometimes known as Buckeye Shaker, sometimes known as Buckeye Woodland, sometimes known as Woodhill. Uh, on the east side of University Circle are the cities of East Cleveland and of Cleveland Heights. So the area has a long history that starts at the end of the 18th century. Uh, Nathaniel Doan built a log hotel at the intersection of what is now East 105th Street and Euclid Avenue. It was originally, Euclid was originally a trade trail that was traveled by uh, Native Americans and later was known as the Buffalo Road because it went all the way to Buffalo. Uh, at the time, the area had been surveyed as East Cleveland Township and was occupied by several farming families, the Dones, the Fords, the Cozads. These are names that you see still around uh, the University Circle area. So the area starts to take shape at the end of the 19th century. So it starts to look the way that it looks today uh, when Jeff the Wade donates the land that we know as Wade Park to the city of Cleveland. Uh, it includes the current site of the Cleveland Art Museum, as well as Wade Oval itself. Uh, and he donated this land for the purpose of um, use as a public park with the intention that it be used for activities that would be freely available to the public. But it's really important to understand that this prosperity was not intended for everyone. Um, the Wade Park allotment, which sits around Wade Park along Magnolia, Juniper, Bellflower, uh, this was sold as a racially restricted area. Uh, it was restricted both through deed covenants and uh, later through outright violence. Uh, in the 1920s, again in the 1950s, there were a series of events that targeted uh, African-American homeowners in the area. Um, and that uh, these events sort of represent actual segregation, but they foster a lingering sense of segregation that exists still in the area surrounding the circle. So in the 1950s, the circle sees um, the expansion and development of the existing hospital systems and uh, also the VA hospital is added in the 1950s. So this all sort of flows from federal urban renewal programs that were displacing residents uh, in the central city. So uh, the growth of these cultural institutions, the growth of the university, there's a real sense that um, there's a need for a vision, for a plan to shepherd the growth of the area and preserve these arts and culture resources. So in 1957, um, there's a master planning committee which creates um, what's then known as the University Circle Development Foundation, later would become UCI. Um, so in case you're trying to do the math, UCI turned 60 in uh, 2017. But in parallel to um, this is the demographic changes that are taking place in the neighborhoods surrounding University Circle. So you have Huff and Glenville that are quote unquote tipping from white immigrant residents to black families that were displaced by some of those large scale urban renewal projects. Um, so again, that prosperity is contained within the institutional area of University Circle and not um, really leveraged out into those communities. So the organization uh, known today as UCI basically has two roles. Uh, we provide services and protection to the area's cultural resources, uh, but we also uh, really strive to connect all residents with the arts, education, and healthcare resources that sit within our borders. 
Um, the organization serves as a land bank and business development organization, uh, supporting the physical development and growth of the area. We coordinate resources like destination marketing, education outreach and transit, parking, that kind of thing. Uh, and we serve the community through public programs like Wade Oval Wednesdays and Holiday Circle Fest, which by the way is happening literally today on Wade Oval from noon to seven. Wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't uh, <laughs> throw in that little plug. Um, but there are still these parallel stories that we are challenged with. Um, they're in both to University Circle as a place and as UCI as an organization. Uh, in some ways, we're kind of torn between the institutions and the neighborhoods that surround us. There's a lot of mistrust between the organization and neighborhood residents with good reason um, that stems from that, that real estate development, from racial inequities, from feelings of unwelcomeness that uh, exist in the surrounding community. Um, just a couple of little of data points that um, sort of highlight this. The neighborhoods surrounding University Circle are densely populated by people of color. Uh, residents have far lower educational attainment outside the circle than those inside the circle itself. This comparison extends to all of those other um, disadvantages that often face historically excluded neighborhoods like poor health, health outcomes, less digital access, um, there's obviously a lot of work yet to do, but we have to tread really carefully to build trust with our neighbors. We, we are not seen by the communities surrounding the circle as a, a bringer of good things necessarily. We're seen as a displacing force. Um, so sometimes that um, building that trust really requires us to mind our own business as an organization, uh, but there are lots of places where we can still have an impact and stay in our lane, basically. So um, as far as minding our own business goes, there are a few projects where we partner with our members and bring folks together to advance the agendas that serve them. So YouGo, for example, is our transportation management program. It provides information on transportation options like transit and carpooling to manage the 50,000 people that come in and out of the circle to work every day. Uh, you can find more information about that at yougointhecircle.com. Uh, Project Yield is another one of our transportation projects that focuses on uh, pedestrian safety in the district, which if you think about it, University Circle is really just one big school zone um, and controlling the um, pedestrian, like, making it safer for pedestrians is a, a high priority. Uh, the Greater Circle Business Alliance focuses on small business development with a focus on minority business owners. Uh, Greater Circle Living partners with the Fairfax Renaissance Development Corporation to um, provide cash incentives for people that work in the circle to live in the circle as well. Um, and finally, the Circle Partners Education Collaborative uh, brings together the education teams of cultural organizations across the region to share best practices and promote uh, equity of access to experiential learning. Uh, one of the best places to capture our impact on the surrounding area is through our community education programs. Education has been a part of UCI's mission for a long time. Uh, the community education team at UCI offers four school-based programs uh, that cater to the CMSD schools in the area, but also some of them do serve the entering suburbs as well. Um, I like to think of community education as kind of the unsung hero of University Circle Incorporated. Uh, we have a staff of seven. It's the largest department in the organization. And in 2023, we'll mark 50 years of serving the communities around University Circle. Um, another way to build trust with the community is to invite them in rather than invading their neighborhood. So um, as a development force, UCI has earned the mistrust of the community. Um, one of the ways that we're trying to change that strategy is to be more welcoming and to offer things, offer spaces for, for people to be within the circle. Um, so this past summer, UCI launched two new summer programs that are expressly for the residents of the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, a new event series called Yay Saturdays uh, is marketing towards those communities and um, offered family activities and performances that highlight uh, specifically the cultural interests of folks in the neighborhood. And that was done in collaboration with our schools and our, um, our school parent groups, uh, getting input and feedback as to what they would like to see in that kind of event. 
Uh, Circle Explorers is a free six week summer camp for middle schoolers in our focus schools. There are six UCI focus schools and those are all within a mile and a half of the circle. So this program is free for rising seventh and eighth graders, sorry, sixth, seventh and eighth graders in those schools. <clears throat> Excuse me. Finally, uh, we recently opened the COZAD Bates House Interpretive Center, which is a small exhibit space telling the story of abolitionists and freedom se seekers on the Underground Railroad. Uh, it examines two local fugitive slave cases uh, and addresses the lasting impacts of the 14th, 15th, and 16th Amendments. The space is really designed to serve as a gathering place for performances and conversations that um, focus on the lasting impacts of slavery. Um, and that is open to the public on Saturdays with docent-led tours. So I am happy to answer any questions about any of these programs uh, and our work engaging in the neighborhoods. I really look forward to Mitty's presentation and hopefully we'll see some of you at Holiday Circle Fest today. I will, um, quick, quick announcement, there has been a power outage at Wade Oval for the last couple of days. We have generators in place. It would, so the event would normally go till seven, but we may have to end early once it starts to get dark. So hopefully we'll see you there. Mitty, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Erin. Um, it's good to see your face. Yours too. And um, I want to thank uh, UUC for, and especially Susan Alcorn, my very dear friend, uh, for inviting me to participate in this forum. Um, I do not have presentation. I came for conversation. Um, but there are a couple of things that Aaron touched on that I would like to talk about. But first, I want to just share something um, that gives you a little bit about the Huff neighborhood. Huff is pretty uh, large neighborhood, actually. Uh, I live in the, the part of Huff that is immediately adjacent uh, University Circle, just the western side of Rockefeller Park. Um, this is a, a, a narrative for the Brookdale Orchard, and I'll talk about that a little later, uh, for the prospectus of the Brookdale Orchard that kind of describes Huff, and I thought it might be helpful. Um, I called it Land Code Location historic huff, farmland, and wetland. Before its 1873 annexation into the city of Cleveland, before the industrialist powerhouse pushed it toward tree-lined pavement, before the mansions, townhouses, and tenement buildings, before the streetcars running on parallel tracks along its main avenues, before its prominent and wealthy residents with their exclusive private schools moved away for the suburbs after World War II in the late 40s, before urban removal, real estate redlining, and white working class flight after black working class migration into the neighborhood in the 1950s, before uncaring delinquent absentee landlords and the riots in the 60s, before the city's abandonment of routine services and improvement in the 70s, before the dropping of crack cocaine, the weapon of mass destruction in the 80s, before predatory lending, plundering poor people's property in the 90s, before the literal leveling of the land in the 2000s, and the developers licking their lips to gobble and, and load it back up again in 2020, the amazing two square mile fertile crescent wetland in the heart of Northeast Cleveland was truly a green city on the Blue Lake. Named for its earliest settlers, which I think uh, there may have mentioned, uh, earliest white settlers, Oliver and, Eli and Eliza Huff, farmers who found their way here in 1799 as parties of Connecticut's Western Reserve expansion shortly after Revolutionary War, the neighborhood within the boundaries of Superior and Euclid Avenue, north to south, and East 55th to East 105th Streets, east to west, was prolific farmland producing fruit and vegetables for the residents of the expanding city of Cleveland and far beyond. Because of its proximity to the lake and its tributaries, specifically the land closest to its watershed and pools, the existence of resident and nomadic indigenous people 
who establish villages and farmlands uh, and farm the land can be traced for at least four millennia before the Huffs arrived. More recently, throughout the 24th, 20th century, Huff was a habitat for vegetable, fruit, and flower gardens proudly established, maintained, and harvested by uh, surrounding homeowners, including those on whose lots Brookdale Orchard is being established. I shared that um, because often we think about uh, the neighborhood surrounding University Circle, uh, and especially I want to say Huff, uh, um, Huff and Glenville to the to the north and Huff to the west, um, and even bits of Fairfax. Even though Fairfax has been um, uh, because of Cleveland Clinic, that development has that expansion into Fairfax has been going on a lot. Uh, longer than what we're seeing now with uh, UCI's Greater University Circle Living, uh, moving, uh, expanding more into Glendale and Huff. But people often think about it as this wasteland, you know, a place where, you know, well, it, <laughs> you know, nothing's really going on there. Nothing's ever gone on there. It's just this horrible place. Um, um, and often, too often, too often, uh, when we think about what happened to Huff, uh, the first thing that comes to mind, the Huff riots. So I needed to put those riots into context with uh, years of things that happened and then years of things that happened after those riots so that we don't uh, kind of diminish um, um, the, uh, 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 we, call it, we talk about Brookdale Orchard as being from Brookdale to broke down. So we don't diminish the brokenness of Huff to just that one uh, incident in our history. Um, having grown up in the shadow of University Circle and also um, being the daughter of, my mother worked at Case Western Reserve, so we had um, really full access to a lot of the programs, a, a lot of the institutions, the libraries, the, the gym, you know, the, to lectures, uh, um, but, but also the other institutions there, just walking up Wade Park, being able to walk up Wade Park where there were homes, where there were shops, um, you know, between my home and at, at, 80, at 88. And you know, what we do clearly kind of uh, consider the epicenter of University Circle, Wade Oval, um, there were shops going all the way up. Most of them owned and operated by um, Jewish or Eastern European um, uh, families who had migrated here, but sh all kinds of shops, everything that we need. We were a fairly self-sufficient community. When you reached 105, you moved into a more of a, uh, maybe, well, there were still shops all along 105. In fact, 105th Street uh, after the 50s, between the 50s and 60s, mid 60s was called the Black Gold Coast because a lot of the Black businesses and business persons who had uh, been relocated from, or as my grandfather called it, urbanly moved from the central area into Glendale um, along 105th Street. And then as courses, when you got closer to Euclid Avenue, you had more of the local mainstream stores there. Um, it was a wonderful place to grow up and live and a wonderful opportunity to be able to take advantage of all of those offerings in University Circle. Um, going to, walking into the, I, the, one of the favorite things of my childhood was, was being able to go into the art museum and throw pennies in the, <laughs> in the big fountain when, when you first walked in the door. That used to be the entrance. Um, and of course, all of the school programs, and I'm, I, I, I'm not sure, Aaron, and you can tell me later, yes or no, if that's still true, but every every school child had access because we went as part of our our annually. You had field trips to all of the museums in the area. I'm I'm trusting that that is still happening. Uh, but as we watched University Circle increase, we also watched the our neighborhood decrease. Um, we need to build a new building. And when I say University Circle, and one of the thing I, things I wanna be very clear, I'm not talking about UCI. I'm talking about all of the institutions 
um, from those that were originally there, the museums, the cultural center, and it is indeed one of the great, finest cultural centers. No, 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 it's been named the best. <laughs> and I would say that's absolutely true um, in, this, in the country. Um, so we're talking about the cultural centers. We're also talking about the education center. We're also talking about the hospitals, the medical center. Um, as we watched those places increase, we watched our neighborhood decrease. You need a new building, get rid of the people who are there. You need um, a new highway to bring other people in, get rid of the people who are there. Um, I have referred to it as the disposable other. And, you, and I've written a narrative on it and you can read it. It is still uh, posted on, um, on, on my business website, Kumbaya, like the song, but, uh, but it's not the song that you all know is the song. <laughs> it is not the feel good, you know, Kumbaya, Kumbaya, Kumbaya means come by here, Lord. It is a gala song that has been, um, but that whole history of even the song has been disposed of and something new is created, a new, um, new narrative has been created around it. But you can read The Disposable Other at kumbayashore.com. Kumbayashore, as in lakeshore.com. Um, we have become the disposable other in the narrative of, of university circles um, development. Um, and, and it continues. And at some point, I think we have to have very critical conversations about that. Um, we cannot continue to displace people. Uh, when uh, during their, uh, Aaron's narrative or, or the presentation, she mentioned that in 1957, when I believe it was a Boston firm that was hired as, to help uh -huh. develop the master plan, um, that as uh, <laughs> people were, <coughs> And of course, I didn't bring any water in with me. <laughs> <laughs> We're displaced into Huffingtonville. <laughs> Actually, we came here because it, created, it offered a better opportunity. So it's not the same kind of displacement that we see today. Black families moved, were able to move into Huff and Glenville. We were not before uh, the early, for, late, late 40s. Some families, a few families were here before. I have to get some water. I am so sorry. So somebody else take the song and dance for my second. <laughs> I, could, I could take this moment to answer one of the questions that's here in the question chat, if that would work. Um, I am dropping into the question chat there, uh, the website for our Greater Circle Living Program um, that someone asked about, uh, about encouraging folks to live in, in uh, the neighborhood surrounding University Circle. So that might give you some more information there. Are you ready, I, Minnie? I think so. <laughs> um, the point I was trying to make is that when my family, for instance, moved here, and we actually moved here from West Virginia, but my, my dad came ahead of time. My father, my oldest brother, came ahead of time to uh, get work and then uh, to, to, to save money to buy a house and then buy us uh, up with them. But many of the family, my, my grandfather, for instance, came here during the Great Migration. We read a lot now about the great migration of African-American people from the South to, uh, to the North. My grandfather actually came here in 1916. In 1919, excuse me, his father came in 1916. But um, we moved into the neighborhood because it provided better housing opportunities. The majority of Black people who did come here from that migration, during that migration, were concentrated <coughs> into the central area was very uh, and very poor housing, and <coughs> I'm having a hard time, folks. Oh. <coughs> so, um, 
moving. I'm really having a hard time. I'm really nervous because I have some responsibility of worship this morning. So it's not as much displacement as it was to come here for better opportunity and though a better housing opportunity and, and uh, more access to things such as University Circle. So what we're seeing now, however, is displacement. What has happened since and beginning as early as the 60s with the expansion of, of Cleveland Clinic, we're seeing not just um, individual families displaced. We're seeing whole neighborhoods displaced. We're seeing whole neighborhoods surrounding University Circle being leveled to the ground. <coughs> and we're seeing a lot of opportunity. For instance, there are millions of dollars of, of, uh, of uh, construction going on in, in University Circle. And now into the surrounding community with more housing being developed, housing that we cannot, the people who are here currently cannot afford to, to live in. Um, we're seeing a lot of construction, tens of millions of dollars of construction, and yet you don't see Black people working. Um, and then, of course, the state really uh, aided in that when it um, uh, turned back the Fannie Lewis Act that actually required that 20 percent of of uh, the opportunities of the jobs of the contracts would go to residents of Cleveland, which are majority black. So I just wanted to put all of that in context with this incredible, the kind of, um, uh, it's like a, a bittersweet, a bittersweet world that we live in around University Circle. You have this incredible world-class community of art and culture and and, uh, and academic institutions and in hospitals, medical centers, um, biotech, you know, all of this stuff, yet right on the, all around it is all of this nothing. <clears throat> all of those shops that we talked about, gone. But not only the shops, the buildings were torn down. So it left no opportunity to go back in and re- um, redevelop or revitalize things that are happening in other communities like Tremont. When you leave the buildings in place, Ohio City, you can go back in and do something. Even University Circle itself, Uptown, those buildings were left there in place so that now they are being reused, repurposed, reused. We were not left with anything. So those are the kind of things that we really have to talk about. We really have to talk about as a as a, a close community and as a large community. One of the things in an earlier conversation with uh, with uh, our host and with Aaron, um, uh, we 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 talked a little bit about how do we uh, become partners in this? How do we? How do? You, how are you able to be progressive, but at the same time, you do not do it at the total uh, displacement and decimation of the existing communities. Um, I especially talk about what happened in Huff going all the way backwards to the indigenous communities because to the indigenous people, because in many ways, that's the way we feel. We feel like we are here. We are, we ha we're not the indigenous <laughs> uh, people of the neighborhood, but we are here now. And as people come in, and it is the same attitude as, uh, uh, as one of my um, uh, 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 Apache friends would say, before we discovered Columbus, <laughs> you know, for people to come in and say, oh, these people do not, they aren't really here. And if they are here, what they're doing, it's really not what we want to do. So goodbye. That's it for me for right now. There's a lot more, but I feel like we will talk about that during our, um, our, our discourse as opposed to this monologue. And thank you so much for bearing with me with that. I'm having a little bit of trouble, but um, thank you. I don't know whose turn it is. <laughs> okay. I, Laura, oh. Laura, should I come back in, Laura? 
I think it's time, it's time for Q&A, I believe. Uh, yes, Ken. Yeah, well, I just wanted to make a few, a, a quick comment, because uh, I was listening to Mitty and I'm thinking about urban removal, as she referred to. And before this forum today, we had a, a conference call. And one of the things that was talked about was uh, it takes a village to raise a child. <clears throat> okay. And that's an old African proverb. But having said that, um, Mitty made a good point about urban removal. If you remove the village or the community, what happens to the children? So I, I hope our listeners will consider that point. But in addition, to, if you'd like to, um, I, I wrote something down here. One mention was Kumbaya on the shore. And people that would like to visit that, it's a neighborhood cafe and boutique that Mitty started. And um, I, I plan to go. So with that having been said, maybe we should go into the Q&A with uh, Debbie and Cliff. Thank you. I, as, we're, as we're getting questions ready, I would just love to um, quickly say that um, I think, Ken, to your point and to the point of some of the things that Mitty was talking about, there is just this very deep connection between who we are as people and the places that we inhabit. And when we remove buildings, we remove parts of ourselves. And it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's part of what makes UCI's development efforts so fraught, right, is that we're in a place potentially that doesn't really belong to us. And so um, we have an obligation as an organization to be better at listening to the voices of the community and hearing the things that people um, feel that is lost when they, when they lose those buildings. I want to say one thing also, two things really. Um, Aaron, we call it vanishing black footprints. Mm -hmm. uh, there, were, there were businesses here all along 105th um, there were black owned businesses. I watched personally because I had my business started out there on 105th. I watched, uh, it, you know, in a very short period of time, less than 10 years, 12, 12 bit black owned businesses disappear. Mm -hmm. um, and Ken, to your point, what happens to the children? Classic example the young people who uh, really were the inspiration that we were working with in our community. To, uh, that they were working with the community garden that turned into Brookdale Orchard. And I, I hope to be invited back sometime to talk about Brookdale Orchard, but turned into Brookdale Orchard. Those children uh, who are now teenagers, some, some are young adults, but they are now gone from the neighborhood. We lost almost all of our youth, 17 youth that were working in that program. When one um, subsidized housing provider decided to shut down 110 units in this neighborhood. And that was 110 families displaced. Um, and we see that happen every 10 years. <laughs> yeah, so those kind of things, you know. Um, well, I, the, the, I have a question that really fits with this, Mitty. And yeah. this is, um, you know, there's, so, so that subsidized housing was taken down. I don't know why that particular one was taken down. I hear a lot of like development of market price units edging out into your neighborhood. Yes. And, and, my, and a lot of those uh, market priced housing, I get, get some tax increment uh, forgiveness for doing those marketplace apartments. And I don't know why it's not required that when you have tax abatements, for re especially for residential housing, you're, that you're not required to provide a certain percentage of subsidized units say, spread throughout that, sub that, that subsidized unit. So if you have an apartment building of 50 units, maybe 10 of them should be subsidized housing, not all in one section of that building, but spread throughout with you know, income or neighborhood, historically part of the neighborhood requirements so that college students don't come in and grab those. And, and that might help mitigate some of this pushing people out and help allow people to stay within the neighborhood. Have you any thoughts about that? Or is there any initiatives working on that? 
I have lots of thoughts about that for years. One of the one of the worst ideas that ever hit this country was called uh, projects. You know, mm -hmm. all poor people. You know, when you compound poverty and ignorance, you're going to breed poverty and ignorance. Number one. One of the reasons why I think black people were able to do so well coming out of um, ins uh, institutionalized slavery with nothing was that we lived together uh, as a community. Um, regardless of income, uh, and, and, you know, and not immediately coming out of slavery, nobody had any income except as we moved further north. We moved with people who had been free and able to establish communities. But I say that to say um, what you're what you're saying makes so much sense. You know, instead of putting all the poor people <laughs> in one little group together that's not going to enable access to so many things. Um, you know, mix people in, have a social economic, you know, we have to integrate not only um, racially, um, but also intergenerationally, also social economically. And then, it all, and then you have people who have, um, but in raising that child in that village, they, they see more options uh, to pathways out of poverty. Um, that's another a whole nother conversation. But yes, one of the reasons why I'm here in my community, why I chose to stay, was a, 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 a grandparent who sent her daughter to me. You know, the girl comes out, she knocks on the door. Are you Miss Mitty? Yes, I, I'm Miss White's grandmother. And she, I, I want to go to college. And she told me to come see you because you wouldn't know what to do. So when we have those kind of accesses and not just um, pushing people out of those mm -hmm. opportunities, then I see you. Come on. I think you all get the point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Aaron, do you have any thoughts about that? Or has the University Inc. had those discussions on how to keep people there? So one of the things that we're really looking at as an organization is the idea of a community benefits agreement. So our authority is really very limited in terms of what actually gets built. It's hard. It's, you know, it's not even something that I really, to be honest, feel like I fully understand. So our role is often to package, to, to collect parcels of land and that we can then package for a developer. We can um, vet those development options, but when it comes to things like tax abatement or um, you know incremental financing, we don't really have any authority there. So oh, that oh, all oh, falls oh, on oh, the state. Oh, oh, oh. So yeah. So what the community uh, benefits agreements that we um, you know have been trying to sort of think about how we can use these there it's a legal document but it's not the it's not like a um it's a contract not a a, a i don't know what the, the word would be where um the developers agree to do certain things and to offer certain things and so we have an agenda that we can promote it's just we just don't really have the authority to oh, enforce it. I totally know that. It's just that we this is a dialogue that needs to be made across. The oh, country. absolutely. absolutely. Because there's so many people like getting these tax abatements and, and then not giving back. So they're sure. just helping rich people get richer, basically. Yeah, yeah and, and right. while our uh, our taxes are getting ready to go up. We right. uh -huh. well right. and that and that is a case. Awesome. Like when you have a gentrified yeah. neighborhood. And you've yeah. lived there for 20 years. Should your tax base really be affected by that brand new development that got a tax abatement? Sixty-seven years. <laughs> and, and part of what we can do as an organization is we can help. Oh, I'm sorry, Mitty. I just talked about no, right no, everybody. No, um, part of what we can do as an organization is to uh, sort of promote the alternative sources of revenue, right? So like offering the abatement is one thing, offsetting that loss somewhere else is another thing. And so we can maybe work on the other side of that to see that, um, you know, that the subsidy is paid for somehow, or that, you know, we there are other things, other ways that we can step in on other sides of that equation. We have another question here. Has the city torn down houses which are in serious disrepair? 
Has this been welcomed, welcomed or not by the residents? It's been welcomed. Um, at, at one point, the Brookdale Orchard came into being because at one point we looked up and we had over, uh, this is just a, a small portion of the, uh, the Huff neighborhood, the, the immediate adjacent uh, neighborhood between um, Rockefeller Park and, um, and uh, East 82nd, uh, where, well, East 79th, those two kind of mainstream. We looked up, we had over 100 vacant, derelict, unsafe, rodent infested, uh, crime <laughs> uh, harboring properties surrounding two elementary schools. Um, so here our children are, and I say to people, you know, it goes back to Ken's uh, point of what happens to the children, um, that there were, there were children walking to and from school who in their short lives never knew that uh, their neighborhood was supposed to look like anything other than, you know, a, 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 a war zone. So, yes, they were welcome. And uh, we advocated for that was part of the, the reason why we formed the Rockefeller Park. Rockefeller Park Community Restoration and Development Association is a community control um, development uh, corporation. We, we are, we are, you know, we're not institution we the residents control it and we formed that for that purpose to advocate for the for the um, demolition of those properties mm -hmm. and then however we decided that we should have a say now that the ground is level physically the planning ground needs to be level we need to be able to have a say in what's going to happen in our neighborhood and how is it going to impact uh, people in our neighborhood, particularly a neighborhood that is let, that's only 37% employed. How are we going to create something here that's going to create opportunities for people and they will not have to have the training, the education, the degrees, the credentials that are required for them to work in the, in the uh, circle institutions? Mm -hmm. Here's a question from Pat. Um, living in East Cleveland, I've been grateful for the work that UCI, um, under the outstanding leadership of Chris um, Ronain, has done for our children. Um, oops. I um, was less happy with the limitations placed on greater circle living. What is your current plan to provide services and opportunities for East Cleveland? <clears throat> um in general or specifically to why don't I try to touch on a little bit of both so um, greater circle living as it exists now uh, the program is changing um, part of the challenge of greater circle living is that it's actually um, while it's run out of UCI in partnership with Fairfax it's actually run out of Fairfax in partnership with UCI uh, the program really exists at the insistence or at the um with the with with the generous support of the cleveland foundation so the cleveland foundation really drives a lot of what happens in that program um, it happens as a collaboration between the employers the community development corporations and the landlords um, whether or not those resources, landlords and developers, I should say, whether or not there are resources to support that in East Cleveland, I'm not really sure. Um, so as far as greater circle living and why East Cleveland is not a part of it, I'm not sure I, I know the answer to that question. Um, but what I can tell you from um, the perspective of the rest of our departments at UCI is so community education has a longstanding partnership with the East Cleveland School District. Um, and we're currently working on some um, outreach with CASE. So the Neighborhood Advisory Council, um, CASE really does a great job of engaging East Cleveland as a neighbor in all, the, all their work to engage the surrounding communities. They've really reached out to East Cleveland quite a bit. And so I think a lot of what we do end up doing in terms of outreach will come alongside CASE. Um, Part of the challenge with East Cleveland in general is the, um, the government, the school board, um, they're woefully under-resourced. And as a result, their staff is 
<clears throat> spread really thin. So when it comes to um, ways to work with that school district or that government, we're challenged by their lack of capacity because we're not a government ourselves. We need a government to support the kind of work that that um, that, that development would require. So as much as the 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 heart is willing, it's sometimes hard to do it from a bureaucratic perspective. And you know, if there are folks that are doing great work that you'd like to connect me to, I would be more than happy to have any conversations, any and all conversations about how we can support what they're doing. And I'm gonna actually drop my email in the chat here just while we're talking about that. I hope that answers the question. Okay, we have another question out here from Amy. What are the public transport tr transportation options available to neighborhood residents? Are they free and readily available? Also, are cultural gardens considered part of UCI? It is an underutilized green asset. So I can answer the second question first, which is to say that technically they are not part of University Circle. Um, the cultural gardens are run by a separate organization with whom we do partner fairly regularly, but they um, kind of run on their own. Um, the first question about public transportation, I can say that we um, offer uh, our Circle Link shuttle, which really serves, um, I would say probably about a half mile to a mile surrounding University Circle. So it goes into Huff, it goes into Cleveland Heights, all the way to Coventry. Um, it goes into Glenville on the north. Um, and all of that information, in addition to real-time tracking of the shuttles themselves, is available at Ugo, um, ugointhecircle.com. Um, we also have a transportation planning um, sort of department that works really closely with RTA to ensure that the neighborhood is served in an appropriate way. And um, Huff, Glenville and Fairfax are very high on the radar in terms of that advocacy work. So that is one of the ways that UCI is able to advocate for the surrounding neighborhoods without coming in as a developer and trying to fix things that aren't really broken. <laughs> so here, here's another question. Um, it sort of touched on it, but it's a little different uh, emphasis. Um, it seems to me that, you, that there are two different aims with the UCI revitalization program. Raising income for city res, in, excuse me, raising income for the city with new residents and new buildings, new everything, and enabling the old residents to remain in community and on the land. Can these two aims really work and can they work in tandem? I am, I absolutely believe they can both work and that the only way they can work is if they work in tandem. Um, and I think it gets to some of what, what we were talking about before with the mixed income housing and with um, housing subsidies and that sort of thing that like until you create a place that is truly diverse, um, you know, that diversity, that vibrance generates economic growth. It's, it's um, you see it in lots of other cities where you have these um, really successful mixed income neighborhoods, particularly in a place like University Circle that's so strongly anchored by our institutions and has so much to offer in terms of walkability and in terms of um, education resources, healthcare resources, job resources. Um, I think that one of the things that we don't do a great job of is, um, when we promote University Circle as a job center, there's a, a tendency to sort of bifurcate that, right? Where you're looking at um, college professors, college administrators, doctors, and then you're looking at the neighborhoods around them and you're associating those neighborhoods with the low skilled work. Well, there's gotta be a way to fix that, right? So somewhere in there, you, upscale the folks in your neighborhood and there's tons of jobs to connect them with in that middle skill level. So, um, you know, I think there's, you need porters and um, all that in hospitals just as much as you need doctors. And in order for the, the district to continue to be successful, you need all of those, all of those people to work there. And, and you need folks in the neighborhoods that have the skills 
to, to get those jobs and keep those jobs. So I think it just, I, I don't think you can do one without the other. I think it has to be a both and. What do you think, Mitty? Um, <laughs> I, you know, so many things are going through my head. I was making notes about the gardens, the cultural gardens, um, which was one of those things that um, is on my resume that we watch the cultural garden. They were, they, they are not, it's the cultural garden federation, but it was a place where we could go to. It was safe. It was wonderful. Beautiful. It was a learning experience about other cultures and people, which always helps people, right. To be able to um, uh, live together. Uh, but we watched it turn into a dump, an, an, an absolute city dump at one point. You know, trash being thrown into it, dead bodies being thrown into it. And in 1986, I made a decision to, I had finished paying for my house where I'm sitting right now, right next door to my parents, <laughs> or I could buy it, stay at Oberlin <laughs> and uh, buy a Jaguar, or I could leave Oberlin and come home and put together the revitalization plan for Rockefeller Park. And that's what I did for the Cleveland cultural gardens. You'll never hear that in the history of what happened to uh, how the garden project you know, And in that process, we unearthed the binky plan, which had been shell and just sitting, you know, in the uh, greenhouse annex for years, nobody doing anything about it. So no, it's not part of University Circle. Uh, I'm glad the University Circle Inc. is in partnership with the cultural gardens, because you're talking about world class. There's nothing else like it. And I'm also very glad that finally, because up until 19, uh, up until 2000, uh, early 2000s, it, there, it really is incredible as it was, there were no African gardens uh, representing the continent of Africa. Now we have Ethiopia, we have uh, Egypt. There were no gardens representing South America. We finally have Colombia. You know, it really was a, a European garden with the with the exception of the Chinese garden, which is not in Rockefeller Park, but in um, um, uh, Wade Park. That was one thing. The other thing was public transportation. One of the first things we saw happening as things started shifting in University Circle was the Wade Park bus line was shut down. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it really did kind of... Uh, um, now, I forgot what else we were talking about, so, but I wanted to throw that in. <laughs> Here's a similar question. We had a similar question here. Uh, my observation experience is that it is possible for people of the same social economic status to live and thrive together. However, it is also my observation experience that it is very difficult for people of widely differing social economic status to live and thrive together. Have you been addressing that very real issue? I would want to hear what the difficult piece, places are. And is it, is it, does it then become um, social economic or does it become cultural differences? I, I, I think it's things like um, taxes, uniform taxes within the neighborhood, you know, um, it, because everybody has to pay, pay the same high level or low level of taxes. So the, the person without money gets taxed out of the neighborhood. I think it comes with zoning rules where you have to do certain colors or certain types of renovations, as an example. So, yeah, I, I, so, so I would bring in a whole, when you start talking about taxes, <laughs> you really don't want me to talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> because when we start talking about reparations, we should start talking about tax eliminate. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I'm going to back off of that conversation right now. You yeah, want me to go to another question? Yeah. Well, I, I, I would just say that um, I, I, I think part of what, you know, to what you were saying about like the paint colors and, and those, those barriers that are put into place that folks don't even realize our barriers. There's another question in here about um, community input. And I, I think it all kind of comes down to that, right? That like as a, as a developer, as someone who's implementing policy, as a, a program creator, your first obligation is to listen to the people that you are trying to serve. 
And if you're not listening to them, you're not serving them. And so like how, you know, for us at UCI, we, this is new for us, right? We're, this is new territory and this is a new attitude and a new strategy. Um, one of the things that we've done uh, in our education programs is we've been working with CASE to do a community needs assessment where we're going to our schools and we're talking to parents and families and seeing what they want, what they're interested in, what they're missing, what would make them feel welcome in the circle. Um, and, and we have the things that we have seen one of the, here's a really good example. And I, I think this kind of, this is not exactly addressing the, the housing situation, but I think it's, it's pretty relevant. Um, the fact that we had been, that we had been working under the assumption that um, people of color living in the surrounding neighborhoods weren't coming to the museums because some of them are expensive and they need transportation. And so we like, let's send a bus around for Holiday Circle Fest and for Martin Luther King Day, and nobody took the bus. And when we actually stopped and asked the question, why aren't you coming? It's because the things in the museums didn't speak to them. They weren't interesting to them. And you know what? I wouldn't spend money if I wasn't interested either. And so it's, it's a conversation, not an assumption. And you have to start by talking to people and trying to understand where their interests are, where their passions are. That's how you build trust. That's how you get people to come to your museums. It's not about free transportation. It's not about like how much you charge, although don't get me wrong, that is getting kind of prohibitive in places. But you have to talk to people. But yeah. the, and, and you can't make a rule about painting your house a certain color, assuming that like, well, that's just going to work for everybody. Of course, everyone wants their house to fit in with everybody else. You know what I mean? Like, you just have to have Definitely. conversations. With people. Let, let me care. Uh, the, Aaron, you, you nailed it. I mean, there is a difference, for instance, between um, community development and property development. Uh -huh. And while mm -hmm. I sat on those, I sat in those meetings, you know, with the um, planning commissions, not just here in, in Cleveland, in Dallas, I was on that committee. Uh, the case advisory committee. I sat on that community on that committee for a while. The, there is a stark difference, and what we have here now are not really a lot of community developers. We have property developers, and when the interest is in the property and not the people, not the community, then it is going to be mm -hmm. uh, uh, dollar driven. That is going to be the interest, and I've heard it. I've heard it. You know, we need. You know, it. It. it it's not about the community, about the people, and about relationships, and about building um, those social economic cross. You know, inter inter um, social economic communities. It's about developing the property. Um. UCI. Excuse me. UCI is obviously not in a position to put significant resources into the surrounding neighborhoods so they can use its influence to get investments in Huff and Glenville. Yeah. What structures are in place in Cleveland and the neighborhoods to make sure that there is community input into such investments? Um, so I can speak to a couple of things. Um, first of all, um, anytime we go into... The, when there is development in Huff or Glenville that that people associate with UCI, we're not always associated with it. So that's an important thing to recognize that like we sit between the city and real estate developers. So sometimes it's kind of what the developer wants to do and has the authority to do, we don't necessarily have a lot of control over. So again, a lot of our role is to encourage them to hold public meetings and encourage them to, um, to, to find ways of engaging with the community before they make decisions rather than after. Um, so that said, um, community meetings, there are a couple of neighborhood groups in the area that uh, we tend to work with more often than others just because we have relationships with them. Um, so a group like Neighbor to Neighbor, uh, some of the, um, the 
work that Neighborhood Connections does, some of those groups, we work through CASE and through their Office of Real Estate, their Office of um, Local and Government Affairs. But I think that um, really the when it comes to our decision-making process, we really try to not come in as when we're doing programming in those neighborhoods, we, we almost never come in as the, the primary partner. We try and come in as a supportive partner. So for us, a lot of times that means working with schools, how um, finding ways to support things that the schools are already doing and make them stronger, um, finding ways to um, reach people where they are rather than ask people to come to us when they have a, a concern. Um, so, you know, it's a work in process, but, um, but we do, we are moving more in that direction than we have been historically. Maddie, any response to that or? I'm sorry. I any response to that question? Well, no, or? You know, I, I think uh, uh, that is it. Um, a lot of the organizations, however, um, that Aaron mentioned are fall under what we call the corporate controlled uh, umbrellas. Um, and so it is, you know, if you get into the people, you really want the people, yeah. <laughs> you really want to look more towards the grassroots. Um, well, as a person who's ears to the uh, pipeline, do you find you hear about developments in the early stages or only in the very later stages? In the later stages. I mean, right now, for instance, um, I'm, I'm Head leaving here, going up the street to our church, uh, to St. Matthew, and um, the land is being cleared completely uh, mm -hmm. between East 86th Street. And we, and so through the pipeline, through um, a, a, a resident who is a union rep, we know <laughs> certain development is coming, right? But not when we have invited folk from the city, you know, from representatives from the city. Uh, no one wants to talk about it. No one wants to talk about it. So you just kind of have to hear through the grapevine mm -hmm. <laughs> of what's going on. And uh, by the time it is, uh, and I know how that's done. I'm also set on the Urban Design Committee, um, not for people. But by the time we get the information, the decisions have already been made. So when we say we're having a stakeholder meeting, it is really to tell us what's going on, mm -hmm. not so much to and you know, there are games that are played, you know, to make you think that you have input, but, you, but it's a done deal. And to thing. be honest, like it, it is. And often UCI is in that, that same position where like we find things are happening in our own neighborhood that we weren't made a part of. Mm -hmm. and there are lots of competing interests and it's hard to, um, hard to get into those processes at just the right point. Need better spies, obviously. You know? <laughs> We need Hercules Mulligan. <laughs> uh, here's a question that takes you away from touchy issues. Um, has the University Circle ever promoted the African Museum, the African American Museum? And has the African American Museum ever worked with UC Museums for additional support and for public relations? So this is actually a much more complicated question than it sounds, oh, it is. Um, okay. <laughs> but it's not, I mean, it's not really, I'm happy to like, it's not, it's certainly not touchy. It's just a little complicated. So there are two sort of parallel processes that take place um, when it comes to museums. And one is our member institutions, our marketing partners, and those are folks that pay into UCI as members to be marketed as part of UCI's destination marketing. So the African American Museum has not historically been a part of that. On the other hand, um, we do have a um, the, our Circle Partners Education Collaborative. We work with museum education teams from all over town. Um, we collect resources and make them available on our website. And we offer um, sort of uh, group learning in experiential learning in museum education, this thing that we're all sort of, as a community, we, we really rely on those education programs to, to keep things moving in the circle and kind of in the city as a whole. Like it's a, it's a, um, a big contributor to the sustainability of these cultural uh, institutions. So um, the 
along with the circle partners, there's our circle explorers camp and our circle scholars after school program where we have been able to support the African American Museum um, through their programming through those um, those other groups. So it's, you know, when we talk about destination marketing, it's one of the ways that UCI is really torn as an institution where we have this expectation of service to our members, which is why we exist. Honestly, like it's, that's what we're supposed to do. But on the other hand, we have this moral obligation to the folks that serve, that live in the communities surrounding us, to those schools, their families, their, their success, and our success are inter intricately woven. So we have this obligation to support them as well. And sometimes those two things, they're not at cross purposes exactly, but they're, it's hard to do both at the same time sometimes. I, I just want to say that the uh, I am hopeful for the African American Museum. There's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, there are certain things that we we assume, and that I knew I, I knew Mr. Fulell and and the passion for his work, and uh, but how important and necessary it is to have that museum and to have it as a viable functioning uh, museum, and to have the uh, resources to do what they have to do, beginning with maintaining a very important architectural um, uh, uh, building that's a Carnegie. Um, uh, uh, Carnegie library. library, yeah. That was also the architect on it was Garfield's son, was President Garfield's son. So, you know, it's just um, having the resources. So to have um, someone to advocate for them, for resources, this is something that we talked about in the conversation leading up to this forum, is the role that University Circle, University Circle Inc. is one of the most powerful institutions in this city. And to be able to be an advocate for some of those um, <laughs> places like the African American Museum is very important. To be able to use your uh, your resources and your power to advocate for resources uh, for uh, uh, other for the community, but especially for institution like that, we should have a world class African American Museum here. There's no reason why we, we cannot. I mean, the Wright Museum in Detroit is incredible. Um, uh, I, I would even well, yeah. So that it's an important no, absolutely part of that. Yeah. And between the the cultural resources that we already have, I'm thinking of like the African American Archives Auxiliary at the Western Reserve Historical Society. There, there should be, and there's actually Destination Cleveland is doing some work around um, African American tourism and how we hold up some of the. Um, attractions and destinations around town that are um, that are about African Americans or are, are marketed towards African Americans and how we can so we're kind of we're, we're doing a little bit of um, collaboration there as well. Um, we've reached a time when the q and a is, is has finally ended, but I want to thank our guests for coming and um, I, I I have questions, but since I'm part of the, uh, the moderator group and so forth, I, I guess it'll have to come to you by email maybe, but I'm sure there is fundings with the revitalization program coming out of Washington and hopefully those funds will make the, their way to, to the neighborhoods. But with that, um, as Laura pointed out, this is the last form for the fall series of 2021. We will be coming out with new topics for the winter series. Uh, probably eight or nine topics. And hopefully um, our guests may participate either that season or the following season. Um, anyways, having said that, again, I thank you both for attending and having your comments. But this morning uh, at 11 o'clock, we'll have a Zoom presentation with our minister, Reverend Randy Partain. And um, he is, uh, I, I, unfortunately, I don't know what his topic is this morning. I wish it would tie in with your discussion. That would be even better. But um, Mike Carney is our music director and he always selects uh, uh, meditative music and it's very insightful. So again, I thank both of you for, um, for uh, volunteering your time and giving up your morning and your opportunity to have a strong cup of coffee and uh, 
the newspaper. There you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Again, thank you so much. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. <laughs> Look forward to more conversation. <laughs>